we're going to talk about friendship. And obviously, friendship is a pretty important concept. We don't call amity amity for no reason at all. Amity is friendship. It comes from the Latin amicus. And in amistad in Spanish, amity in French. So friendship is really important. Uh, but there's some things really happening in our country which are disturbing. This is from the uh, American Sociological Association. And it really talks about American circle of close confidence, people that they trust, has been shrinking dramatically in the past decades. And the number of people who say they have no one that they trust to really discuss important things in their lives has more than doubled uh, in the past few years. You're looking at a thing from WebMD saying, is your circle of friends shrinking? Why is it on Web WebMD? Because your health, your physical and psychological health, is in many ways very dependent on your friends, on the number of people in your lives that you're in your life that you really trust and you can really talk to honestly and hang out with and have fun with. So uh, this is a paper, actually it's the Arizona Daily Star. This, this article really shows uh, Americans shot pollsters in the 80s when they said they had only three close friends that they could talk to. But this, and this was more than a decade ago, say they have just two, and one in four people say they have none, nobody. So we're really increasingly living these very siloed lives. And, you know, it's wonderful to have the internet, uh, you know, and uh, all this media available, but that doesn't, is not a substitute for actual contact with other human beings. So this is, there's two sociologists, uh, one from uh, Duke University and, and one from the University of Arizona, and they started uh, doing some research uh, on social isolation in America. And their main conclusions were the average number of people who are considered close confidence had dropped in, in a matter of uh, 20 years from 2.9 to 2.8. Uh, so they dropped by almost a third. And Dr. McPherson one of the, said, we were really surprised to see such a large change in such a short period of time. Usually these kind of changes in social patterns occur over many, many decades. Uh, and here you're seeing it occurring relatively rapidly and in a way that is a little disturbing. So 25% of Americans report they have nobody to talk to about important matters. Another 25% report they're just one person away from nobody. They've got one person. And so in that 20-year period, the number of people who had no one to talk to had doubled. And the average number of confidence went from three to two. So why? Well, we, uh, we, we all thought that the, the computer age was going to bring all this leisure time to people in uh, the United States. But in fact, people work more and more hours. Uh, they take their computers home and work from home. Uh, uh, and so they have really less time to develop friends and spend time with friends and to be social. Uh, so, and, and, you know, technology plays a role in that. You know, people, I've been, actually been in, in, in situations where people are texting me from the same room. You know, rather than coming over <laughs> and asking me a question or engaging with me, they're sending me a text and I'm saying, what? You know, you're 20 feet away. Uh, 
so, you know, computers, iPods, video games, television, all these kinds of things tend to make us more socially isolated. Uh, and we live in much more social isolation. Uh, interesting, you know, uh, when, when I and I have traveled, you go to different parts of the world and you really see people. I remember being uh, in, uh, we, we went to Italy for our 40th wedding anniversary and uh, uh, in southern Italy, and we were in a lot of small towns. Everybody knew everybody. But then we went to a pretty large town, you know, 25, 30,000 people. And walking the streets at night, men walking, uh, two or three guys together, holding hands with their arms around each other, talking. Uh, I mean, j just amazing the amount of social connectedness uh, and, and, and for us coming from, you know, the United States, I mean, first it's wonderful to see, uh, but we just don't see it here. You just don't see that kind of physical and social intimacy amongst people. So what? Okay. Uh, the other researcher, Dr. Smith Lovin said, quote, this change indicates something that's not good for our society. Ties with a close network of people creates a safety net. Those ties also lead to civic engagement and to political action. So it's not only bad for us in terms of uh, our own mental health and, and feeling of well-being, it's kind of bad for our society. Uh, you know, people don't vote. They don't engage in civic action. They don't help their neighbors. Uh, many, many people live in apartment complexes where they don't know anybody. You know, at all. So even though we are, uh, at, at least at present, the wealthiest country in, in the world, we are paupers in terms of community, social interaction, and mutual trust, uh, which you find uh, in other countries in much more abundance than we find in the United States. So a lack of inclusion uh, hurts our social and psychological well-being. That's interesting, the first psychologist, before they came up with the word psychologist, were called alienists. That was really the name, an alienist, because it seemed to them that the root of most problems was social isolation. And I think that's right. Um, so how do, how do we become human? Uh, and you can remember Aristotle was the person who said, the man outside the polis, or outside the community, is either a god or a beast, He's not a human being, because our humanity is really developed in community. I've told the story uh, of, of some of these studies that were done in the uh, 1800s about wolf children. L literally, there were some children who, you know, children would wander off and, uh, of course, most children who wandered off into the woods died unless they were recovered. But there actually were some studies, some, some actual uh, uh, incidences of children being adopted by wolves. Uh, well, so <laughs> they didn't turn out to be very good as wolves. I mean, <laughs> you know, they didn't have fur. They didn't have the right set of dentures. Uh, and uh, uh, they couldn't run on all fours, but nonetheless, they survived with these uh, packs of wolves. Again, not many, but... Uh, so, well, what happened when you recovered these children? Well, uh, it was interesting because they never learned to talk. Uh, they were always uh, very, very uh, paranoid and, and anxious uh, in, in human interactions or even being around other human beings. They never really got comfortable uh, being in a, in a human interactive situation. Uh, so what does it tell us? Well, it tells us that genetically they certainly had the capacity to be you know, fully human, as we consider to be human beings. But they had missed this developmental phase 
which occurs by in, in this caring socialization process that we all go through as children. They miss that. They were with wolves. They, they learned, you know, some wolf things, but they didn't learn the things that we consider to be human. So we have the capacity, our genes give us the capacity to be human, but we become human in this process of socialization with other human beings over a fairly extensive period of time. Uh, that African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child, is really true. You know, the isolation that we're experiencing, that people are experiencing, to some extent, means that we are becoming less fully human, you know, as a species, which is kind of disturbing. It may explain more of the things that are happening uh, in our society, the mass shootings, uh, and some of the terrorism activities uh, can be perhaps traced uh, in some ways to this. When, when uh, uh, Nai and I visited Bali uh, uh, quite a few years ago, uh, it was really, really fascinating because uh, we, we went to, the, uh, first they, they said, uh, this guy who was serving us in this uh, uh, little village hotel we were in said, you guys are a little different than some of the other, other tourists. Would you like to come to our village? Uh, so, you know, we had to dress in the, the traditional garb and so forth. So I went to their village and these folks live in a ceremony. I mean, was every, every month they spend 24 hours, the entire village, the entire village, the babies, the elders, uh, in ceremony, uh, singing, uh, dancing, uh, making music, uh, you know, reading poems. I mean, it's uh, uh, just remarkable. Uh, we went back again a few years later and, and the same village was taking two months, the entire village. Men, women, children, elders, everybody working on a ceremony to honor someone who had died five years before. Amazing. I mean, they, they have this incredible ceremonial life and they are so connected to one another. Think about the amount of social action, interaction that happened in that two months. Uh, uh, they were connected in a way which it's actually kind of hard for us to imagine. So social networks are really, really important. Uh, it's interesting. We have, a, I have a, a, one of the little uh, things we do sometimes in workshops and things like that is we get everybody uh, maybe we've got 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 people and we get a, a ball of string and we take that string and we say, okay, we take it across the room to somebody and that person takes it to another person. And pretty soon you have this incredibly complex uh, meeting of all these strings uh, together uh, uh, and then you can say to somebody, okay, Get somebody who's kind of heavy and have them lie in the middle of this thing, you know, and they can be just held up by, by, by string. And it's a way of visualizing our social connectedness and, and, and uh, metaphorically showing how strong those connections are. And we say, okay, now you've got this chubby person out there in the middle. One of you drop your strings. And they will, and he's still supported because so many other people are holding the strings. And it's a way of, of really kind of seeing what we don't see because it's invisible. These really powerful social connections we have and how valuable they are to us as individuals and, as, and, and in our social networks and in community. So it's not just immediate family that we need though we need immediate family. Uh, we also need larger social networks to other persons who are connected to us. Uh, there's a great story, uh, uh, this fat, kind of a historical story. When Simnon was getting started, the first American therapeutic community uh, in the 50s, the uh, uh, 
the local neighborhood uh, in Santa Monica, California was not happy about having this uh, group of ex-addicts living together, men and women, and particularly black men, black women, Latino men and Latino women with mixed with white men and white women. You know, this was the, after all the 50s uh, uh, and they got completely nuts and they tried to uh, run uh, the organization out of town, literally. And uh, the, there was a senator, his name was uh, Nick Petras, uh, in the California legislature, who took up uh, Sinanon's cause. Uh, and uh, uh, many, many years later, uh, I was not there for that seminal event, but I, I visited Nick Petras in his office. And he told me a funny story, which I've always recalled. He was Greek, Petrus. I think it probably was Petronopolis or something was probably their original name. And his uh, dad worked in the shipyards in Oakland uh, and uh, in a little Greek neighborhood, little ethnic neighborhood. And it was kind of considered, uh, the, everybody in the community kind of raised the kids. It was really, it takes a village to raise a child. And everybody had kind of common expectations of those children, what they, what they should do and what they shouldn't do. So one day, Nick's dad is coming home from work. And uh, there's a little boy who's beating up on a little girl. And Nick's dad <laughs> grabs a little boy by the ear, marches him up to, to his home, and calls for the woman of the house and uh, begins to explain uh, that this young man was out of line. And the woman says to him, let go of my kid, who the hell do you think you are? So Nick said uh, at night his dad would sit at the head of the table and when he was upset, he would tell, talk to the kids and say, you Americans, because <laughs> uh, he was an immigrant. Uh, he, he would say, you Americans, you're gonna lose your country and his uh, his uh, lecture that night, uh, or sermon, or whatever, was really this breakdown of community, that the sense that all the adults could uh, guide and discipline the children, because we all had common expectations, was really, really important uh, for, us, for community and for kids to grow up uh, with, with this understanding of what adults expected of them and how they were, what, what the guidelines were. Well, I think Nick's father would be rolling over in his grave today when uh, no one feels that their children should be, expectations from others should be imposed on their kids. Um, where we live in these gated communities uh, where uh, even children don't even walk to school and they're all delivered you know, by their parents to the school and, and take, you know. We live in such a very, very different world in this world of, of a lack of connections, a lack of community uh, is one which really kind of threatens us, not only as individuals, but as societies. So we need social interaction and close interpersonal relationships to become fully human. That's the wolf story, the wolf children's story. We're living in a society which the number of close interpersonal relationships is declining dramatically. So are all the things that we're seeing, mass shootings, the seeming indifference toward others uh, that is beginning to permeate our society, are these related to this? Can we trace them to this? So one of the, probably one of the most isolated groups in our entire society are people who are using drugs. <laughs> uh, they really don't have any, they have marketplace relationships. I mean, you know, with, if you've got drugs and you'll give them to me, uh, yeah, you're my friend. But other than that, I really don't have any concerns. I remember uh, very dramatically, somebody said, I really thought I had friends. Then I overdosed and they left me to die because they didn't want to get busted when the police came. That was 
what I thought friendship was. <laughs> I had to reevaluate that, right? Why is it so important to have a place like Amity and other places around the country and around the world? Uh, because it's not all about recovery or survival. It's really learning how to be a friend. It's learning how to make and keep friends, real friends, and learning how to build networks of close friends based on mutual respect and trust and honesty. You know, maybe to some extent the decline in friendship is, can be related to the decline in personal honesty between people. Uh, do we trust people enough to really be honest with them? Um, do we trust others to be honest with us? Uh, the paradox, of course, is we've got to take risks. Uh, we have to learn to be honest first, make the extensions to others to, to find out whether it works, you know, and whether it'll be re reciprocated. So uh, all of you, who, all of us who are at Amity, we have a, a unique opportunity. We are in the Balinese village <laughs> where, where there's a lot of opportunities for social interaction, for personal connections, for honesty, and for learning how to build, to make friends, real friends, real friends, who, a real friend is somebody who will stick with you kind of thick and thin, but will also like pull you up and, and admonish you when you're doing stupid, irresponsible, self-destructive things. And if you learn this skill, how to make a friend, how to be a friend, how to build social, positive social networks, Man, you're golden. You can take this wherever you go in your life. You know? And if you don't learn it, you've got a problem. You know, uh, the problem of social isolation, which is uh, really, really difficult for people who have uh, a lot of the problems that people who come into Amity have. Um, so you're learning how to become more fully human. Uh, it's uh, don't waste the opportunity uh, it's really about your potentialities. Interestingly enough, uh, I, I had this uh, experience, uh, you know, in the in the '80s. I'm up in my office, and some new newcomer is answering the phone, you know, and says, "Hey, Rod, uh, there's somebody named Alice Miller on the phone. Do you want to talk to her?" <laughs> okay. So Alice Phil Miller is probably one of the most famous uh, psychologists of the, uh, of the 20th century. I uh, did this uh, incredible work on the effects of early childhood trauma on later adult experience, including addiction and, uh, you know, m uh, many maladaptive kind of behaviors that people end up with because of traumatic experiences in their childhood. So I'm just like, be having like somebody say, there's Freud in the line, would you like to have a chat? So, you know, I had a very interesting hour-long conversation with, with Alice Miller, and it was really about, uh, 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 she, we were using her work and there was gonna be a film made, and she wanted a, a place that was using her work to be filmed, which we were. But in that conversation, we talked a lot. She was very curious about, about Amity, and what we were doing, and I kind of described the, the community, the teaching and therapeutic community, and, uh, and at the, in the end of the conversation, she said, oh, I get it. You're really teaching people to be more human. And that's really what this is all about.